Hey there. Hello. to find our host code. Sorry, we changed the host code recently and I'm trying to find where it is. So just a moment, because I want to record this. Does anybody know where to find the host code in the Zoom admin interface? Uh, the host code is on the front screen. It's your, isn't it on your profile screen, right on the front? It's not. It's not? No. Uh, you know, we had to set passwords, so we changed everything. Oh, wait, wait. There we go. Fine. The host code, yeah. It's buried the... down in the settings. Oh, is it not? Did they move it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Ta-da. Okay, so now I can actually record. Yay, there we go. <coughs> okay, welcome everybody um, to CNCF. I um, contributor, I, well, governance working group of the Contributor Strategy SIG. Um, uh, it's our regularly scheduled meeting and we are subject to the CNCF code of conduct. 
Um, let me post minutes there. I don't have um, a um, huge agenda today. Um, a couple of things was, <coughs> pardon me, we had a governance discussion um, the TOC meeting this morning. And I wanted to recap that, particularly the sort of um, three deliverables that came out of that, um, because we'll be involved with that as a working group. Um, and um, then uh, just, you know, go over what we've got in progress um, in terms of people's work on PRs and the stuff that we already knew about. Um, if somebody, does anybody have any other business for the day? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, actually, first question was, um, I know Matt was at the TOC meeting this morning. Uh, Don, uh, Jaime? Yeah, I was there. Yeah. By the way, welcome, Heine. I don't think I've seen you at this meeting before. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm actually from Sanadia, uh, and I just rejoined like uh, a few weeks ago, actually. So pretty okay. new to everything. Okay. Well, welcome. Yeah. Um, the uh, it's small. As you can see, it's currently me and Don and Matt uh, this morning. Yeah. Um, we have more people working on deliverables, but um, okay. Not necessarily everybody makes the meeting. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the other guys. I think Sarah are, said she'd be here at thirty past. Yeah. Yep. Um, so to recap really quickly, um, the meeting started out with a discussion of Alexis's original sort of steering committee proposal. Um, I that proposal was not adopted, um, but after a bunch of discussion, what came out of the meeting instead was the idea that we would mutate the um, and replace what's currently the multi-organizational requirement for graduated projects and instead require potentially three things out of projects that are closer to what the CNCF really cares about. Um, one being um, a sort of longevity sustainability plan for, you know, how does this project continue, um, I, you know, even in the face of potential commercial challenges. Um, uh, you know, that was sort of discussed by the TOC. Um, we'll obviously have to be involved in it. Um, uh, that seems likely to be a governance document, but um, not quite uh, sure exactly what one of those would look like. Yeah. Um, second thing is requiring feedback on the roadmap from community and end users. Um, and there was a discussion <coughs> of making a contributor ladder um, or analogous um, plan a requirement as well. Um, but I didn't get as far as, as sort of getting general approval. I mean, I'll note that there wasn't actually a vote on any of these things. Um, but people were pretty positive about the first two requirements. People were generally positive about the third requirement. It's just that it didn't come up in the last five minutes of the meeting. Did, I, did you get, is that a good summary, Matt? Um, so the general idea was, um, I forgot who said, Matt, were you the one who suggested this? Somebody suggested, they pointed out that, hey, if requiring multi-organizational maintainers is kind of a proxy for these other issues that we care about, why not just require that projects do something directly about the other issues? Um, and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of what I said in the meeting was, because there were a number of issues going around and there's really no one right way to solve them, to come up with some criteria that needs to be put in place, um, think about it as a pattern, and then come up with two or more uh, implementations that people have done of each of those things, 
and then maybe point to some examples of governance that are a full thing that look like what we want. You know, maybe one's a steering committee, one's something else. So that way people can see what's really needed, different patterns for solving it and learn an understanding of how it solves it, along with seeing an overall governance that does these things. That, that, that was kind of my, my shtick for this. And, and I also want to point out here, um, and, and I know I said it over there, the multi-org maintainers, there is one little nuance to this that I think is problematic towards the real end goal. Um, because the end goal is what if a vendor pulls out, then what happens to projects, right? If it's being driven by a vendor, then how do you have that longevity of a vendor just pivoting away and leaving, right? Well, if you've got multi-organization uh, maintainers, that doesn't necessarily solve it. If you have one vendor, and a bunch of their customers. Because if that vendor pivots away, the customers are gonna pivot away, the project's still in a lurch. So it doesn't completely solve it if they're very closely related in that aspect. Uh, like you don't have any competitors in the vendor space there. Yeah, the other thing it doesn't solve is the issue of um, allowing code for different implementations, packaging, et cetera, in the project. Right, because if the multi organizations is one vendor and their customers, then if another vendor comes in and say, hey, I want to add code to make this compatible with my product, the existing governance structure doesn't in any way guarantee that that is going to be well received. Um, um, so, um, the um, yeah, so this is going to be interesting because you know SIG contributor strategy in general is probably going to be in charge of writing these the documentation for this. Um, the um, and a couple of these the require feedback and the longevity plan are interesting in that these are not things that we have good examples of in existing mature projects. Um, at least I don't know of any. Yeah, I, um, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. The, um, and so, and the required feedback is a little bit easier <coughs> to imagine. Now I do know examples of this because we actually have in our internal maturity model for Red Hat, we actually have stuff about having, you know, open forums for customer feedback, et cetera, for Red Hat projects that operate within Red Hat. Um, so I think that's pretty easy to imagine. Like, I don't know a canonical independent documentation of that, but it's a, easy to imagine what would be in that document. So the longevity plan is, you know, hey, imagine I'm, imagine I'm Kong and I'm writing this for the Kuma project and currently 90% of the code on Kong comes from Kong, on Kuma comes from Kong employees. What do I put in this document? Um, the, um, yeah. Oh, and, and one other thing just hit me. What about yeah. projects that don't have vendors? And GRPC is going to be my example of this, right? They are an incubating project that presumably someday will want to go for graduation. And what do they look like? Because they're not something like Kubernetes or Prometheus that you're going to run with vendors. What does this model look like for them? The, um... Yeah, that's a good question. Well, the thing is, in a lot of ways, I mean, effectively, gRPC is more of a spec project. And, and eventually, I'd like to actually see kind of different guidance for spec projects. Because the nice thing about spec projects is once the spec reaches 1.0, the required maintenance on that spec drops a tr tremendous amount. Compared to like a code project, right, where the maintenance required for a code project after it reaches 1.0 only goes up. Okay, then, then I'll pull out a slightly different project. Let's take Helm, for example, a package manager. Yeah. You see tons of people using it, whether it's people using it directly to install things. 
and there are people who distribute their stuff over it, but find me of, and, and there are people who build stuff on top of it, right? Like we've works flux or yeah. I'm now at rancher and rancher has fleet that's that uses it, right? We, we use this stuff all over the place, but find me a vendor that will just provide you helm support. And the same thing, find me a vendor that'll find you homebrew or apt or yum or any of those supports for package managers in general, you don't tend to find it. And so there's an example that's kind of hard because it doesn't fit the spec model and it doesn't fit the, um, it doesn't fit like the Kubernetes Prometheus being offered by a vendor model either. And I imagine there's more projects like that in the uh, CNCF. I haven't really thought about it, especially with the proliferation of new sandbox projects. Um, I guess, but what's the problem? I mean, like take Helm again, what's the problem yeah. with that in terms of sustainability? Because I mean, like for as long as Red Hat customers, even though we don't sell Helm, for as long as Red Hat customers are using Helm, I don't see us True. pulling our contributors off the project. True. Um, okay. Yeah. The, um, and, and that gets into what uh, do you use as a definition for vendors around it, right? Because there's uh -huh. a vendor who sells a direct support contract and maybe there's, you know, it, that, that really will get into the question of vendorship, I think. Yeah, I really don't like to focus on vendors. Um, I mean, for me, what I what I think is important in this discussion is um, the discussion of contributors. So, so less of what vendor is going to eventually do something with this piece of software, but do we have do we have contributors from a bunch of different companies contributing to it? Because that that to me, I think, is kind of the the core of of the problem we're trying to solve. It's less about the vendors taking it, more about who's contributing. Yeah, the, but I mean, the, the problem came up in some of the discussion here, right, is that even if we take a hypothetical project, like for example, take uh, Harbor is a good example of this, right? Um, Harbor has a majority of VMware contributors. They have a bunch of contributors from other companies, but there's a bunch of VMware people who do things that no one else in the project knows how to do that are critical to getting a release out. Right, um, and the um, so if like you're looking at worst case scenario, you're imagining a scenario where, for example, VMware has a fight with the Linux Foundation and pulls all of their people out of Linux Foundation projects and starts running their own fork of Harbor. Then, you know, even though there are additional contributors who don't work for VMware, I don't know that that really solves the sustainability problem. Those additional contributors are not capable of carrying the project. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, that's something that, you know, we've seen in the Kubernetes project as well, you know, where, you know, it's Google employees that hold the keys to, to certain things and we've backed out of and, that quite a bit, but it's easier in Kubernetes. It's harder with a project like Harbor where so much of it is you know is our employees at vmware yeah and the thing is it doesn't even have to be a permissions thing right it can just be a knowledge thing right mm -hmm. like in kubernetes nobody is preventing other people from getting involved with kubernetes performance but the simple truth is 90 percent of kubernetes performance is wojek and um blanking on, on our second performance lead but 90% of it is those two people. And, and if we lose those two people, then Kubernetes is gonna go through an extremely delayed release where we try to figure out why the performance tests are broken. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, <coughs> <coughs> so a lot of this comes down to the trouble of what does a sustainability plan look like in the reality of who contributes what to projects? Mm -hmm. Well, if this was easy, we would have solved it already. Right, yeah.
to. Yeah, the um, so that's going to be challenging, and I think we're going to have to go back and forth to the TOC because I think it was sort of easy to say that we should have this, but trying to figure out what one looks like, I think, is going to be a long effort. Um, the um, I'm more sanguine about pushing for requiring a contributor ladder because that's something I would have liked in the first place, right? I mean, I honestly think by the time a project gets to graduated, they should have, you know, some form of contributor ladder. And and in a lot of cases, I think that's more important than um, counting noses on the um, uh, on the maintainers group. Yeah, absolutely. The um so Okay. Um so I guess the second thing is requiring feedback. I mean, obviously for, you know, part of the discussion this morning was around steering committees, obviously for a project that decides to adopt a steering committee model, um, there's an obvious way to manage feedback. But what about for other projects? So here, I'll tell you something as a project here. I've been going around trying to get more feedback from people. I've done things like email the CNCF and users list. Um, I've offered up end users who want to come sit down and have time. And it actually turns out for a lot of projects, pulling that end user support and, or that end user feedback isn't always an easy thing to capture, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the Helm project, we found that when we're face to face at a conference, we can usually grab somebody at a company who's a user and sit down with them. That's a pretty easy thing to do. But in this virtual space saying, hey, can I get a half an hour of your time or who wants to talk about it, who wants to give feedback? It turns out it's not such an easy thing to go collect that feedback and just sit down with somebody and talk with them. And so what may be obvious for some or the inroads they have in their project isn't obvious for others and they don't have the, the setup or even people willing to give them that feedback on another project. Yeah, the, um, um. Yeah, and I think end users in general are kind of hard to engage with for a lot of projects because they're not, they're not intimately involved in the project. You don't yeah. know who to talk to at the end user. You, you may know that a certain company is using it, but if it's a I, big company, who do I start with? I'd actually like to, you know, hear because the TOC was kind of vague about whether they want to use the term end user or community. And I'd rather kind of focus, you know, and try to steer them towards making the requirement community feedback. Because, uh, you know, for example, there's going to be a whole set of the community who are not end users, but still should have input in the process. You know, minor contributors, um, developers, you know, people who develop stuff on top of the platform who aren't necessarily end users. Um, I mean, actually, for a bunch of our CNCF technologies, they're already trying to redefine end users because if your technology is basically a developer tool, the developers are your end users, even if they happen to work for vendor companies. Um, so, um, you know, and, you know, for that matter, you can get a lot of feedback for, from those people. Like, for example, um, if part of your community consists of independent consultants, then those consultants can often tell you a lot about what the actual end users are doing because they are intimately involved with it, even if you can't reach those end users directly. Yeah, I absolutely oh. agree that the focus, I, I would like to see the focus on community as well over, over end users. And I think this one in particular is, is really important, getting feedback on the roadmap because this is where I see a lot of projects sort of fail is that 
especially if one vendor is particularly involved, it's really easy for their product managers just to kind of decide on the roadmap and things just happen and nobody else has any transparency into what's going on for feature planning or roadmaps. And so I think this one's really important when you're talking about getting over the hump of having a project controlled by a single vendor. Yeah, I'd also like to point out that end user in CNCF terms can mean a very specific community. There's uh, the CNCF end user group, which is now over a hundred different companies that aren't vendors, but they're end users and they've got their own private meetings and they discuss things and they even elect their own TOC members. So when they're talking about end users, sometimes they're not generally talking about, well, just people who generally take this stuff, pick it up and use it, but this actual CNCF group and a way to get their input into the projects. And quite frankly, one of the ways that I would like to see that group get their input into the projects is by getting the developers at their companies to contribute to those projects. Um, and I think that would be a really useful thing if we could somehow get, you know, not just have somebody like Apple hire a bunch of people who work on Kubernetes and related projects, but have people who are already at the company start contributing to them and, and changing that conversation. I mean, I think that is one of the goals of the end user community. Um, I don't know what level of success they've had, um, but I think that is one of the goals. I mean, I also think in terms of preparing guidance for projects on collecting feedback, I honestly think more CNCF projects could reach out to that particular end user group um, because I've done it on behalf of Kubernetes and they were happy to tell me lots of things. Um, the, um, <clears throat> so now that's not, that wouldn't be the whole of how you can get feedback, but it's certainly a mechanism and, and is nicely one that has a defined structure. Okay. Anybody have anything else on that? I guess next thing to do is going to be to open some issues to develop these things. Um, the, um, so um, I will go ahead. Do we, do we want to do that or do we, I, I feel like the steering committee meeting was kind of all over the place. Like these are our takeaways for what we think are maybe the right things to do as the next steps out of that meeting. I wonder before we get too far down the path of putting together docs for this, do we want to circle back with the steering committee and make sure that these are the right things to do um, and maybe provide them with a little more information about what we think would be in this doc to help them kind of make that decision. But, but I do feel like there, there wasn't really anything tangible that came out of the steering committee meeting today. There was a lot of, a lot of different people with lots of different opinions. And some of them were louder than others. Yep. So, okay. So, get TOC to approve the idea that this is the next thing that somebody's going to work on in this area. Yeah, it's probably a good idea that to know that it's something they're interested in before somebody goes off and spend hours trying to put this together, because if they're not really interested in reading it, then people will waste a bunch of time. Mm -hmm. Well, and for one of them, for the sustainability longevity requirement, we're going to need lots. We need to start with lots of feedback from the TOC because, you know, again, that's, um, it's amorphous. <laughs> The, um, okay, um, anything more on the meeting this morning? Okay. So we'll get issues.
Yeah, G, draft revisions to multi-organization requirement for graduated projects. I can't imagine why that's still open. The, um, <laughs> um, okay, uh, mostly with the content tracking open. Um, did we knock anything else out this week? Um, I started work on um, policy and procedure paperwork. Um, the, um, not done yet. The, um, Dawn, do you get any chance to, uh, hammer anything out? No, I'm still, I know I'm still on the hook to do the, the charter documentation. Yeah. Um, to be honest, these last week or two have been sucked up in conference prep for, um, talks in yeah. October. The, um. Yeah, I know I'm going to be saying the same thing in two weeks because of all the November stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm trying to do them a little bit early because I just need to get them recorded. And if I can just get them recorded and done, then I can focus on some other work. So I'm trying to yeah. just get ahead of things a little bit. Yep. Well, one thing that we have now is um, Vicki put up her catalog of governance documentation. That was um, Which is a treasure trove of examples. Um, so um, it's nice. I'm going to go back through. I mean, that's one of the things I'm doing with the policies and procedures. Is I'm like, okay, I'm going to get three examples of every one of these documents from that. Mm -hmm. um, the um, um, for um, hi, man, Matt. This is uh, this is doo -doo -doo, looking right here at our content tracking. So these are all of the documentation and content that we know we need to write. I actually have not put the templates in here because the templates are their own directory. Mm -hmm. um, I see, you've just got a little bit to write. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, this was, I don't know, other people got into this. Part of my goal in this team is that there just really has not been a consolidated location for this kind of guidance, right? There hasn't been an external location that we can just point CNC projects to to say, hey, this is how you run an open source project. Um, and so, you know, part of at least my personal reason for um, helping start contributor strategy was to actually make that a thing because, right? Because I see these projects coming in and they're, sponsored by companies who have not done public open source projects before. And, you know, they don't know what to do. They've never done it before. Mm -hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the last month, I've had people from more than one company on more than one new sandbox project say, uh, can you help us get going with governance? Can you point us in the right direction? And I'm sitting there going, what do I point you at? I start asking sure. questions and then I start pointing, okay, you do things like this. Here is kind of what somebody else has already done in a graduated project and here's their governance and it's sort of similar to what you've got. So I'd start by reading this one and maybe a few others like it. So you get an idea of what other people have already graduated with. But that, that's the extent of what I've got. And then answering their questions and trying to explain things, actually having something to point people to that's well-rounded and thought out that teaches them doesn't exist. And it is a needed problem. And I just say that because I've been bugged a bunch of times on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard problem too, because every project is different and what every project needs for governance. There's no, there's no cookie cutter. You can't just send people to this and it's like, you need this and this and this. And it's, it's really easy. It just, it doesn't work that way. So like the leadership selection doc that I put together has like 10 options for how you might select leaders and some of the best practices for, you know, for doing that. But it's not, it's not, this is what you do. Check. The, um, yeah, I mean, one thing that actually came out of this is I kind of think I almost want to add to this that I think we actually do have a few projects who could use a steering committee for completely different reasons. Like there's been some back and forth around graduating the OPA project. And honestly, you know, looking at it from the discussion and looking at it from the OPA project is they do actually have a problem with coordination project wide. Like that's a project where I actually look at it and I'm like, you know, this actually is a project that could use something like a steering committee 
not for anything to do with graduation, but because they have all these people working in these sort of isolated areas on the project who weren't really coordinating with each other. The, um, so I almost kind of think like uh, we could eventually add more on the, you know, so you think your project needs a steering committee mm -hmm. type document. Um, just because that's more complicated than some of the other governance models. Well, the talk I'm writing for the Open Source Summit EU is all about governance. So I'll probably think of other things that we need that we haven't even put on the list. Cool. Yep. Okay. Um, so we got that. Um, uh, Matt, um, for that matter, Jaime, you can see the list of, of things if there is not a name after any of the items on that content tracking, it's because nobody has volunteered to be responsible for that. Um, so um, feel free to grab any of those for that matter. Even if somebody has something assigned and it's not done, um, feel free to ping that person because all of us have multiple competing things on our time um, and if there's something that you're like, hey, I already have stuff for this, um, don't don't hesitate to speak up just because somebody else has their name attached to it. Um, okay. Can I ask this, sir? So there's one called Security Issue Handling Guidelines, and it's Mark Sig Security, and next to it is the name Jennifer. Yeah. Who's Jennifer? Uh, Jennifer Davis. She was going to coordinate with Sig okay. Security on the 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 little bit of glue code that says, hey. Your project, as governance, your project needs to have a documented process on how you handle security issues. And here's a link to all of SIG security stuff about that, because they have stuff about that, right? But when a project is looking at the governance section, they need to realize that this is actually part of governance is to have that handled. They, they have a security handling guidelines? Yeah. Um, it, they published it recently, too. Um, yeah. I mean, the governance component of it is more, you need a process to select the people who are going to be on that security committee. Um, the, um, and you need to have requirements for what the security committee people do. Um, the, um, like, they don't take security reports, patch their employer's products only and not tell anyone about it. Now, I'll be curious to go read it because uh, one of the things that we're touching in lately is embargo lists, like what Kubernetes has. Um, and I think Harbor and Kubernetes are the two with embargo lists that I'm aware of. And I'm curious to see how others are looking to stand that up or otherwise. Yeah, a lot of projects don't have anything formal, um, which is bad. Because, because yeah. among other things, you know, completely aside from they may actually have a de facto process for handling security stuff. But if I discover a security hole, and I'm not a regular contributor to that project, I need to know what to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So on Helm, we actually have this and we use yeah. the GitHub security notification thing that's been added. And they go out and it, it's a little slower to have them go get the CVEs with it uh, than me myself going out to get it. We'll actually get CVEs and uh, have them do it because you get private branches automatically from them when you use it. And so there's a lot of neat things if you actually use it. So we've had a, a security process for a while um, over on Helm, but I'm all actually looking to say, how do we revise that process to improve on it? Because there's this whole, okay, we've got this far, but is there a way to get better at doing this and what criteria? And then what could we share with others then too? Yeah. The, um, yeah, and that's, that's what we have to have in there, but it has to be together with SIG security because they're yeah. writing guidance on this and, and details of, you know, how you handle this, that, and the other thing that is like their job. So totally. 
totally. That makes uh, sense. The, um, yeah. So, yeah, so we'd actually, so for Matt, what we'd done is we'd started with, so basically what we need to create falls into three areas. One is sort of guidance documents or, or advisory documents that explain qualitatively how to run a project, yeah. right? Um, often with like Dawn's leadership document, a whole bunch of choices. Um, and then the idea was to go from that to then providing backing material for the CNCF requirements that are governance related. Um, and the reason we went in that order is because honestly, a lot of that backing material is going to be, you know, in order to fulfill this requirement, you need to do this. And here's the document that gives you advice on how to do that thing. Okay. Um, and then the third portion is templates. So we have um, a template project that has templates for all of the paperwork that your project might need. You know, things like a contributing .md file and, and you know, a governance .md file or a steering committee charter or any of these various pieces of paperwork your project might need done in a sort of mock-up template format so that a CNC project that comes in with some of these things but not all of them can honestly just fork that project and use the templates there to build the rest of their stuff. Let me ask this because I see you're working through the documentation. Where is the final output of the documentation going to live in the form that, that people can look through and read it? Right. That was actually a topic of um, last week's contributor strategy meeting um, because it is undetermined um, because we don't actually have a good location for any resources for CNCF project contributors. Um, the, um, um, it's just not something that CNCF has created. And so we're kind of punting that back to CNCF, which is to say, hey, we need a place for this stuff to, for the approved versions of this stuff to live. Um, and, um, the um, um, and you know figuring out where that is is kind of because we came up with a couple of ideas. Um, CNCF staff said no because of conflicts with with some of the names that you know some of the spaces that we looked at, um, and so now we're kind of in the hey, there needs to be a place where approved stuff lives, ideally it should not just be in a Git repo. There should be some sort of web publication so that people can actually Google it. Like maintainerdocs.cncf.io. Yeah. The, um, and then initially you we suggested, one... Yeah, initially we suggested maintainer.cncf.io, but they use that for that grid. Yeah. And now moving the grid would be a major website breaking issue. Yeah, we spent we spent like forty five minutes bike shedding on this in the other meeting. Yeah. So yep. I'd like to avoid that and Yes. Yep. So um the um but yeah, we do need a place. And 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 that's okay. been an outstanding issue. Mm -hmm. And I should really just go ahead and open an issue with the T O C I guess and say find us a place. Um the um because because there's a bunch of other stuff in addition to all this governance documentation, we want a place for maintainer circle activities, um, which is another project of contributor strategy. Maintainer circle activities, we want a place for them to post their stuff, like you know upcoming events that okay. sort of thing. Um, the um, you know and other stuff for. You know this is the group of people running CNCF projects and they need a place for their stuff. Yeah, we really just need a place for guides in general. And then we have loads of types of different different guides. But that's a matter of finding a place that isn't that isn't already being used by somebody and that the CNCF is willing to to give up. Okay. Yep. All right. I have to drop. This was absolutely wonderful and enlightening. Um, I will try to stick my nose in again and see if something jumps out for me to. Mm -hmm. contribute to cool. 
And if you had a name, I would actually be willing to chase that to the ground with the CNCF, but we don't have a name, so. Um, green, green.cncf.io. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Matt. Thanks. Oof. Um, can somebody pick up on the on any notes for the meeting just because Google Docs just kicked me out for no apparent reason? Um, yeah. The, um, they actually do this once a day. <laughs> and I cannot figure it out. The, um, so, Okay. Um, uh, so, do we have any oh, apologies PRs? for being really late. Um, yep. I had another meeting, but uh, yeah, I'll just, just lurk unless something comes up that uh, we can contribute to. Okay. We're just finishing up here, actually. Um, we don't have any open PRs. Um, so, um, that's actually kind of the complete discussion unless somebody has something else. I'm good. Good. Okay. Um, well, thanks everybody. We know we still have our roadmap of content that we need to prepare um, uh, for Colin, we're, we're actually, our next step is to actually confirm the deliverables with the TOC out of this morning's meeting, which will probably take some time. Um, okay, the, um, great. And, um, and that's it. So I'll see everybody in Slack, try to get some uh, content documentation advisory guides written and, and we will continue soldiering on. Thanks everyone. Sounds good. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye now.